All right. Hi, everyone. Um, so we are about to get started. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, we will be beginning um, working through the Fair Compensation Case Study Webinar. So just a reminder for everyone before we get started, keep in mind that if you have any technical issues, you can use the chat to let us know. And if you have a question during the presentation, please go ahead and add it to the chat section in Zoom. At the end, we will have a Q&A session. Um, so any questions that you have, uh, we're hoping to get to there. We will be recording today's webinar so we can share for anyone who is unable to attend. For today, we are going to start with some introductions and the living wage progress overview from FLA staff. From here, we will move into the panel discussion with our panelists from Maxport, New Era, and Puma, and we will close up with a Q&A session. Um, today, I am joined by my FLA colleagues. This includes Renee Bauer, Senior Director of Social Compliance, and Tiffany Rogers, Senior Manager of Social Compliance, as well as Fung Do, um, FLA Man Regional Manager for Southeast Asia. Before I pass it over to Renee, I'm going to go ahead and launch a poll to gauge everyone's uh, general understanding and interest in what they find important when it comes to living wage progress. So go ahead and select the answer that resonates with you the most. Okay, great. I'll give everyone about a minute or two more. Okay, great. I am going to go ahead and end the poll. Oh, just a few more coming through. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. And it looks like today um, our participants are saying that developing a living wage action plan or blueprint um, is something that they find important when it comes to living wage progress, as well as collecting and analyzing workers' wage data and ensuring worker voice and collective bargaining. All great. Thank you, everyone. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to not share. <laughs> um, okay, so with this, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Renee um, and she will be walking us through the next part. Great, thanks, Emily. You can go ahead and go on to the next slide. Oh, fantastic. Uh, it's really impressive to see so many of you joining us from, um, all around the world to talk about this really important topic. Fair compensation and living wage has been a strategic priority for the FLA for a number of years. Um, and uh, tonight is a really uh, exciting moment because it's one of the first times that we're really sharing um, some of the practical results of our efforts. And it's thanks to the companies that will be speaking this evening um, that uh, a lot of progress has been made. Our commitment to living wage is embodied in the FLA's Workplace Code of Conduct. We have a code element on compensation that acknowledges that every worker has the right to a wage that allows them to provide for themselves and their family, uh, meeting basic needs, and having some savings in addition. Um, we see this as a fundamental right. Uh, we've um, been very public about that, and all FLA member companies have in turn been public about their commitment as well. 
We also recognize that unfortunately, this is a right that is not always met. Um, and in fact, is often not always met um, in um, the apparel and footwear industry and other industries as well. And so the code element is um, a bit aspirational. Uh, we've made a commitment that where uh, compensation and wages don't meet a living wage, then every employer, so every um, factory, every supplier, every buyer and the FLA, along with other stakeholders, will work together to take appropriate actions to improve wages and meet a living wage. So what this really says is that this is a collective effort. And I think you'll really see that embodied um, in the stories that you hear tonight. Our approach to a living wage really follows um, this general roadmap. Um, companies start by collecting wage data and analyzing that data against living wage benchmarks. So in other words, the starting point is to figure out in numbers what an average worker is making in each facility and how that compares to what they need to make in order to meet basic needs and have some savings. What that data and analysis does is then let each company start to develop a blueprint, start to set priorities to say, here's where we're going to start first. And that can look um, different for different companies. Some companies decide to start in a certain country or a certain part of their supply chain or just a certain facility. But what's important to us in our work is that we start and that we all start together to set priorities and then take action towards living wage um, and be public about that action um, and the commitment. Uh, I wanna quickly mention that um, you'll be seeing um, several different graphs and charts uh, throughout this webinar. Um, these are all uh, data visuals that come from the FLA's Fair Compensation Dashboard. So we developed an uh, Excel tool that um, very easily and, and in a scalable manner helps um, companies determine what the average worker wage is in each facility, averaged out over time and occupation. Um, and then that tool is uploaded into our online dashboard that automatically maps those average wages against um, transparent and publicly um, available living wage benchmarks. Um, and what we've seen is that that information is very, very powerful. Um, in helping um, companies and um, others set priorities. And the reason I mention it uh, is because we've seen how effective this can be. And so we've recently made the Fair Compensation Dashboard available to companies outside of the FLA. If you happen to be listening and learning um, this morning or this evening, wherever you are, and if you're um, someone who's been struggling to figure out where to start, on your living wage journey, please um, get in contact with Tiffany and myself and Fung and the team. Um, and uh, we'll show you some more details about this dashboard because we really think that it can be a powerful tool. With that, I'm going to uh, pass it to Tiffany to talk a little bit more um, about what we do at the FLA. And then we'll dive into the specifics of the stories you'll hear today. Thanks, Renee, and uh, hi, everyone. It's so great to uh, see you all on this webinar. We have such a wide range of participants, so um, love to see it, and I think we are able to see such a global presence. Uh, I'm Tiffany Rogers, Senior Manager of Social Compliance at the Fair Labor Association, and what I'm going to talk about now just a little bit is uh, Renee has kind of gone through some of our members' requirements, especially for our companies, and um, uh, a little bit on our tools. And I'm going to just talk a little bit more on some of the actions that we've taken and plan to take on living wages as part of the Fair Labor Association's kind of greater uh, multi-stakeholder structure. So our primary focuses have been on research and pilots, member accountability um, that Renee had just talked about. And we're also focused on investment in living wage benchmarks and studies and measure and studying living wage progress and finally reporting on that progress. Um, that's a lot of things that we would love to talk about and spend a lot of time on, but we're today we're really just going to focus on measuring and studying progress and you'll see how we've been able to do that through some of the tools that Renee just mentioned. And again, if interested to know more, please uh, just let us know and we um, would love to share more with you on the tools. 
So to set the stage for the case study, I do want to mention our broader social compliance work um, that allowed us to collect a variety of data points uh, for this case study. We conduct factory level assessments to assess our code of conduct in our members' factories, and these reports are published. And these assessments inform our wider company accreditation program and the progress of the remediation of our company members are making to address labor violations in their supply chain. So our companies are assessed at the headquarter level and we ensure that they are implementing responsible purchasing and production practices and have a robust social compliance program to ensure that workers' rights are being protected. And through both of these streams of work, we're collecting wage data and working with our members and their factories to measure the living wage gap and progress. Um, and so it's through these avenues of working with our members to improve working conditions where we were able to see examples of improvement and that really set the parameters for this case study and how we wanted to consider progress and specific, specifically focus progress on three areas of hours of work, purchasing practices and production practices and wages. So our case study has um, a couple of examples of factories based in China and Vietnam. So I wanted to provide just some general analysis of what we're seeing in our hours of work violations from our factory assessments. So you really can see the, the challenges that we're, we're dealing with here. And so from the analysis of our factory assessments, we know that China has the high, highest frequency of hours of work violations. 97% of factories have an hours of work violation and 90 4% of factories exceed 60 working hours per week. We have similar insights to Vietnam, which isn't a surprise knowing how quickly Vietnam's economy has grown and how well they've done in apparel and footwear. Um, in our assessments that we've conducted from 2012 to 2019, 85% of factories have an hours of work violation and 74% um, have longer weeks than 60 hours. And while these violation frequencies are lower than in China, our analysis shows higher frequencies and other types of hours of work violations, such as rest days and accurate overtime pay. So we just wanted to provide that greater context to also frame how important it is that we start to understand and study how overtime violations not only need to be remedied, but in a strategic way can support in achieving living wages for workers in the garment sector. What this analysis confirmed is, you know, essentially what we already knew, but it had shown to us that there's a greater opportunity in remedial mediating these excessive overtime violations to shift overtime wages toward regular wages for workers to increase their take home pay. So our report includes examples in the supply chains of New Era, Maxport, and Puma. All three companies um, are producing in the global fashion industry. And we have two apparel examples and two, uh, one footwear example. And we have a range of factory sizes. So we have a small factory, a medium-sized factory, and a large factory. So you'll see a bit of a range of what it can look like to see improvement of purchasing practices, production practices, and also wages for work workers. So one of the things before we get into the actual company data is I really want to emphasize some of the learnings and the, um, the key takeaway that we found in all three cases. We could see improvement of wages and uh, decrease of working hours within two to three years. And so that's just, just a huge importance to us because that can start tomorrow. That's progress that can happen within 24 to 36 months. And, you know, as the fashion industry forecast styles and trends, you know, out a few years, there's no reason to not also forecast for living wages for workers in that same amount of time. And we could also see that wages in our case study increased past the rate of inflation and also the global living wage coalition living wage estimates in those countries, ranging from about 29 to 57%. So with that, let's get into the details of our first case study example, which features New Era. 
So New Era is a headwear and apparel company based in the US. They have been an FLA member since 2003, so about 18 years. And they achieved FLA accreditation of their social compliance program three times, most recently in February 2020. We conducted factory assessments and collected wage data at a factory in Yangsu, China that employed a little less than 100 workers. From our assessments, we found that 93% of workers worked 40 to 74 overtime hours a month for an average of 64 overtime hours a month. The factory's production plan also required workers to work a 56 hour regular work week, meaning that overtime hours is included in the production planning, which violated FLA standards. And New Era worked with the factory to address these overtime violations through an extensive action plan. James from New Era is going to tell you more about that process in our panel later on. It was definitely beyond your average compliance corrective action plan and really took a holistic view in improving working hours and production efficiency and engagement of workers. So now I'm going to briefly get into what we're looking here on the screen uh, before we get into New Era's progress. So your top chart shows the net wage progress and we align with the anchor's definition on net wage and it includes the average monthly workers basic or contracted wage, plus in-kind and cash benefits and subtracting any taxes and deductions. Your top bar is showing your um, 2017 wages and your bottom bar is showing the 2019 wages. And that dotted line is showing the estimated rate of inflation. So this is essentially a zoomed out look at what workers' wages were looking like at this factory. And we can confidently say that workers' wages increased past the rate of inflation. Then in the bottom chart, we have a more zoomed in look at what the breakdown looks like for workers' wages in 2019. So we can see that the averages across workers' basic wages, in-kind benefits, cash benefits, incentive pay, et cetera, you can see that in the stacked bar chart. The factory's average and each occupation shows that the workers' wages meet or exceed the Global Living Wage Coalition's estimate without overtime pay. Uh, workers' wages at this factory increased 57% on average from 2017 to 2019, and the average surpassed the Global Living Wage Coalition's benchmark for this region in China by 4%. And what I really want to emphasize here is the level of the of transparency on this analysis and the actions that New Era took with this factory are really important for us to highlight and share. So that we're able to understand how workers' wages can increase through remediation of excessive overtime. And James will talk more about the details of how that happened by working with the factory. Um, so now I'm going to pass it off to Fung, our regional manager of Southeast Asia, who will share more on the analysis from Max Ford and Puma. Thanks, Tiffany. Um, and uh, to continue, I would like to bring you uh, the Max Ford case study. I saw a lot of participants and a lot of you came from Vietnam, which is great. Uh, Max Ford is an apparel supplier group with the headquarters in Hanoi, Vietnam, and they got a credit by the FLA in 2019 after many years of affiliation. The group, they own the three facilities in North Vietnam, which employ more than 5,500 workers. And the case study is one of Maxport factory located in Nam Dinh, Vietnam, which has 500 workers. Um, this is a supplier for Team Shark, Kev Bendu, Lululemon, and Nike. Yeah, next slide. Next, please. In the case study, I have to say Maxport is the unique example within our three case study showcasing the action a supplier group can take to improve the wage beyond a living wage benchmark because the group, they use living wage benchmark as an initial goal, not a final target. As an FLA participant supplier, Maxport was able to apply a comprehensive approach to understanding wage working hours and productivity bonus and incentive to the FLA wage data collection tool, analysis and the accreditation recommendation. Furthermore, the Maxport management and the whole group, they took the ownership by applying the FLA guidance and also the internationally recognized labor standard to improve the condition for its supplier. So in the chart, you can see Maxport living wage progress over five years which shows the success of management, worker, 
and by a commitment to improve production practices. In total, I would like to emphasize that worker real wage increase was 39% from 2015 to 2020. So deep progress shows the improvement of responsible purchasing and production practices and the compensation system contribute to the living wage progress beyond the inflation. So with incentive pay earned during the regular work week on the worker occupation, they earn more than 50% higher than the urban living wage estimated by the Global Living Wage Coalition for Urban Vietnam Area in 2019. So you can see the huge um, higher than um, the urban living wage um, uh, benchmark. Um, so you can, which is the lie with the purple color for you easy to see. For example, I wanted to call now the most significant improvement for sewing worker came in 29, uh, 2018 after the factory implemented the additional type of incentive pay. Within just one year, the sewing worker, they earn an average increase 49% of their monthly net pay. And later on in the panelist uh, section, you can um, you will hear more from Maxport representative on how they in, can improve the progress and reach the living wage. The third case study is from Puma, a famous footwear apparel brand with the headquarter in Hozo, Germany. They are three time accredited FLA company. Puma case study is a footwear contract supplier. So this is the only footwear manufacturing in our three case study, a huge factory, a member of Better Work Vietnam located in Tainan would employ more than 5,100 worker. Yeah, next please. So back in, um, so the, the fourth chart, you can see the differences between um, the net weight from 2016 to 2019. Back in uh, 2016, the factory monthly worker average net wage was 18% below the global living wage correlation estimate for rural Vietnam. In three years, the factory is worker, Puma and Better Work Vietnam, they work together to close the living wage gap in total, worker monthly of average net wage they increase 43% between 2016 and 2019. So by making the concrete change to their payment system and production planning, Puma and the factory successfully increased the wage for worker during the regular work week. One concrete change I would like to emphasize was the improvement made to the worker cash benefit. In addition, with incentive pay and leave pay increasing, Worker monthly net wage was 26% above the rural living wage estimate um, for rural Vietnam area in 2019. You can see the lie with that green color. Factory incentivized production efficiency during the regular work week, and the worker were able to earn the higher wage during the regular work week through the incentive bonuses. By 2019, the worker incentive pay during the regular work week increased over 200% per month. This progress made by the worker, factory and Puma ensuring living wage improvement across the various payment type for all the production, uh, production workers. And now I would like to over to Tiffany for the insight. Thanks, Fung. And so there's just a lot more that we could share on this report and the full report will be published um, in August. And so we hope you all will just take a look at it once it comes out. Some of the insights that we just wanted to share in one that I haven't really talked that much about yet is the incentive pay piece. And, and that was really important. Um, and when we looked at how incentive pay helped transition workers wages to shift from those overtime hours um, to the regular work week. And we also found that the incentive pay started to diversify as well. So it wasn't solely dependent on uh, productivity.
So the last piece I just want to just cover are just some of our recommendations and then we're going to get into our panel. Um, but just some of the things that we saw are really practical and sustainable solutions. And we saw generally common themes around production planning without overtime. That was a key shift that some of the factories have had to make to ensure that the production planning was based on the regular work week. Uh, and then also ensuring that production and purchasing practices are complementing each other, especially the planning practices between buyers and suppliers. We also found that incentive pay um, needs to incentivize workers' performance during the regular work week and also be diversified beyond just efficiency and productivity. And last but most importantly, worker engagement, collaboration, and training were absolutely essential to make this progress. And so the case study will go into more detail um, for you to all look at once the report is published on step-by-step um, -step how these uh, companies and factories made progress on that. Um, but for this webinar, we're going to invite our companies to speak to this process. And so I think we're ready to do that. And so Emily, I'm going to um, pass it off to you as we get ready for that. Great, thank you, Tiffany. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and introduce today's panelists. Um, today we are joined uh, from New Era, we are joined by James Lee. James Lee is the Social Compliance Manager for the Asia Pacific region, and he joined New Era CAP in 2012. His job is supporting New Era in promoting supply chains code of conduct um, and compliance with that, and also best, practice it, best practices in labor standards and EHS in the APAC region. From Maxport, we are joined by Huang Do, Senior Compliance Officer. Um, Huang oversees internal compliance monitoring and recently facilitated Maxport's Fair Compensation Program. She is experienced in social and community development programs initiated by NGOs, and she has spent a few years working in assessment and verification bodies. Um, in addition to Huang, we are also joined by Ha Pham, um, who is the compliance manager with Maxport Limited. Ha has a wide range of experiences with Maxport since she began with them in 2003, and she spent more than 15 years on developing and overseeing the company's compliance and management system. Thanks to her broad knowledge and practical gains from both the production and sustainability fields, Ha has been really proactive and passionate about addressing and resolving the challenges affecting the workforce and working conditions at Maxport facilities. Um, and she has also proposed new strategies for moving beyond compliance. Um, in addition to our representatives today, we are joined by um, Annie Fan. Um, she's the senior manager of social sustainability at Puma. Um, Annie is in charge of the Vietnam and Cambodia region. She has been with Puma for one and a half years. And before joining Puma, she worked with different multinational companies as the health and safety regional expert in compliance. So with that, I think I'm going to go ahead and move it into our discussion. Sorry. Thanks, Emily. So we can um, close the PowerPoint and I'm going to invite all of our panelists to turn on their cameras. And while we're doing that, um, before we get into like the company panel questions, I do just want to recognize that all of our companies, uh, New Era, Puma, and Maxport are FLA accredited companies. And we've not really talked about that process. So I thought maybe, Renee, um, could you speak to the accreditation process and maybe speak to some of the information that might be helpful for those that are not um, familiar with it. Yeah, of course, thanks, Tiffany. So FLA accreditation is the process in which we evaluate a company at the headquarter level to ensure that that company has the systems necessary to maintain a socially responsible supply chain. Um, and that really goes beyond just monitoring. Um, it, it looks at whether a company has transparency, has relationships um, with all of their facilities or suppliers um, that are uh, strong. It looks at uh, whether companies do training with um, suppliers and workers and factories. 
Uh, it looks at whether companies have grievance mechanisms, CSO engagement, et cetera. So it's the really comprehensive um, process. And I think what's really key to the stories that you'll um, hear more about uh, from our panelists is that accreditation ensures that responsibility for the supply chain is shared. Uh, it's never just one factory or one supplier um, or one company that can really fix any of these problems. It's about making sure that all of those stakeholders work together um, and have the kind of communication and transparency that's necessary to create change. I mean, as Tiffany already mentioned, communication and transparency, really radical transparency is what we, one of the things that we really value um, at the FLA because we have seen the difference it can make. Thanks, Renee. And um, so just to build off of that shared responsibility, when we talk about excessive overtime violations, we know that this has been one of the critical issues in the fashion industry. And one of the things that we hear is that it's really hard to remediate because everyone's working overtime and, and everyone wants to work overtime. And I think what we're trying to get at at this case study is actually workers don't need to work overtime if they can make a living wage during the regular work week. And if, if factories can work to um, ensure that workers don't need to uh, work excessive overtime and companies can work to ensure that their purchasing and uh, planning practices support that, then we can have increased wages for workers and they don't have to work as many hours. So I wanna kind of get into um, some of the stories that our companies have to tell. And so we're gonna start with New Era. And James, I'm just so grateful that you can be on this panel today and speak to your experience with this factory. Can you talk a little bit about how um, New Era tried to um, understand the overtime issues, how they found them and investigated them and, and how New Era dealt with these issues with the factory? Sure, thank you, Tiffany and Randy. Uh, hi guys, uh, my name is James Lee and uh, I am working uh, with New Era. So uh, what I'm going to share with you that is um, uh, how did my company investigate um, the overtime issues? The way that our company investigated the overtime issue is we request our suppliers with high risk of excessive overtime issue, which identified by previous audit report of the excessive overtime issue to provide monthly working hour records for our review and provide this data to our partnering audit firm to cost check whether there are any discrepancies of attendance records during the audit. We occasionally conduct surveillance audit if necessary. As you know, this is very important for us to address the overtime issue because we request our suppliers to be transparent. And in the meantime, we also request them to comply with FLAs and new hours, hours of work code standard. So uh, this is the first part uh, that I want to share with you guys. Thanks, James. That's really helpful to understand just the comprehensive audit process that Nura went through to really understand those issues. Next, I'm going to um, pivot to Puma. And Annie, thanks again for also joining this panel and uh, working with us through this case study. Can you just provide some background on what you saw at the factory um, before the remediation of the working hours violation started? And what were some of the largest concerns that Puma had and, and, and the factory had around addressing them? Yeah, thanks, Tiffany. Uh, so good morning and evening everyone. Uh, my name is Annie. I'm from Puma. So to answer your question, so in 2016, we found that the factory had that the, have a worker work more than 60 hours per week and often in 13 days in a row. So uh, the, the another issue is the overtime calculations was based on the uh, hourly rate and not according to the law means that the overtime fees rate didn't calculations based on 150% of regular fees rate as per legal requirements. And the factory, uh, when the factory, they apply the fees rate systems, which also discourage the workers to take leave, uh, to take a break, and especially discriminatory the uh, pregnant women. 
So as the result that the average worker monthly incomes was about 82% of 2016 um, GLWCs living way estimators. And uh, furthermore, we also see that the worker overtime wage were represented about 60% of their overtime wage. And, and with those findings, so the factory uh, showed their strong commitment to change. And, and when we, we start with the change, I think the most challenge uh, with the factory and Puma uh, was identified is about how to promote the product efficiency and how to communicate effectively to workers to understand the new wage system and calculations. When we move from fixed rate system to an hourly railway system with a production bonus. Thanks, Annie. You know, what you just mentioned around pivoting from the piece rate system to the hourly wage system was one of the key learnings that we had in, in studying the Puma case study example. And, and I think a good one to understand where we've seen criticism of the piece rate system. Um, uh, from civil society and and it really can drive workers to work long hours and not make enough money and so for Puma and the factory to transition from a piece rate system to an hourly wage system is uh, really important so workers can depend on those wages and then what we also were able to see is that it led to increase of wages and so um, workers were able to uh, experience a higher wage um, in, a, in a more equitable manner. Um, so thanks for, for including that. Um, okay, so I want to get Max Floor included into our panel. And so, um, you know, one of the things that we talk a lot at the FLA is around um, understanding the root causes to labor violations. And Hung, I was wondering if you could talk about, you know, what were some of the root causes that Maxport saw in the overtime issues that um, we found in this factory? And were there other issues or concerns that were raised in the discussion and looking in those root causes? Um, good morning and good evening, every uh, attorney in, in the webinar today. Uh, I'm Huong from Maysport, and uh, I'm located in, in the capital of Vietnam, in Hanoi. And um, I would like to share with you some of our insight and our root cause that we, we learned during the, um, when we got the issue of overtime. overtime. And generally, when we when got a fighting, uh, excessive overtime, we wouldn't say that, oh, it can be for like um, urgent order and some like some something like this, but uh, it's will lead to like a vicious circle that will be repeated and repeated again. But um, as a, a, a way affiliate, we uh, got more chances to to dig in and work more detail on the root cause of the problem. And as featured in the FOA SCI assessment report in uh, 2015, uh, after our assessment at the factory, uh, we um, analyzed two root cause and it's uh, identified and, and recorded in, in report. The first is work for the lack of an effective system at play for dealing with urgent orders. And second, it will assume that not own brand sourcing from the assessed factory is FOA affiliated and responsible sourcing is not an obligation for them. And I think it's such a kind of very um, general um, description and maybe like lead you to some um, uh, missing information. So uh, I would love to talk more about the engagement of three parties that include factories, the buyer, and our worker in the making of assesses over time. And from our point of view, the factory is a key factor in controlling the working hours. And at the time of assessment in 2015, Maysport had not well developed and maintained an effective monitoring and responding system in the event that we're getting urgent order. And we faced up with variety of unanticipated technical problem during uh, bug production, resulting in the last joy, it's our last joy of exceeding, exceeding the overtime limit so that the delivery time and product quality could be ensured and the shipment can be made to, to our buyer um, at a like, reasonable time um, frame. And uh, in addition, it's also for either supplier like us and the buyer have not well adapted and applied the concepts of responsible purchasing and production practice during that period, you know, 2015 is like seven, six or seven years ago. And we're not 
not so much and um, not pr promoted that concept so hard. So maybe it's quite not familiar to, to both ourselves and our buyer in to, to following that practice. So why we want to sell as much as possible, brand also wish to purchase at high volume and reasonable prices. So as a result, the company and buyer have not yet closed, closely collaborated to balance planning or ensure that the volume of order is appropriately placed at our factory capacity, real capacity. Yeah. So it's leading to the excessive uh, like over capacity and we need to work more and more time to, to resolve the problem. And now uh, the third party that we need to mention is about uh, our worker. And it was generally understanding that at the time that more income would come along with more working hour. We, we in the, our history, all our worker um, assumes like that. And that's what we're willing to work overtime to complete their tasks and receive appropriate payment in return. And as a factory and worker did not have any problem in coming to mutual agreement for overtime working hours. So it was possible for us to deploy the workforce and to have them like voluntary and 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 like um, agree and collectively work together to handling us and other. So that's a problem. <laughs> and um, after the audit and after the assessment, um, and there were no issues, other issues raised by the factory uh, worker as the company were aware of the. Um, Chance in nature, not systematic of the overtime issues. And the non compliant occurs during the peak period, but not significantly repeated. And by, by, by looking at the root cause, we will um, be able to look for the um, corrective and, and um, preventive action plan. So from, from, from then on, we do not have um, the problem of uh, excessive working hour. Thanks, Hung. And what you touched on, I think, maybe gets to one of the questions that's in our, our Q&A around um, complementing production planning around um, buyers purchasing practices. And so I really liked how you spoke to three major partners, the buyer, the supplier, and the workers, to really regulate um, to ensure that working hours are stabilized, but then the importance of buyers and suppliers working together to ensure that that the planning and the volume are meeting and, and matching so that the supplier can execute what the buyer is hoping um, to get in their production order. So thanks so much for that. And I don't know if anyone can hear, but there's a thunderstorm happening right now in Maryland. So I hope I <laughs> don't lose my Wi-Fi. <laughs> um, all right, so we're gonna keep going. Um, and I wanna talk about remediation. And so in all three case studies, there was extensive remediation planning that happened to improve the um, the conditions for workers, but then also can improve the, the factory conditions and how the factory operated. And so in all three cases, we did see um, significant investment in either the machinery at the factory or the changes to the compensation system itself and um, the changes that needed to happen to pay workers more. And so we did see significant investment from the factories to really consult with experts to um, make these improvements. So James, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, when it came to developing the remediation actions to address the overtime issues, can you just talk to that process and, and how it went with the factories and what were some of the things that were included in the corrective action process? Sure, Tiffany. So uh, for this case, we will rely on our brand of this factory to monitor the remediation actions, but I can briefly elaborate the process. We work with the vendor for the accessible time issue was found in an other factory before actually. At that time, we hired external consultant to help vendor reduce the accessible time buying consult with experts to transition a higher base wage payment system. We shift work pay from an hourly wage to a higher base wage for uh, each occupation, which in incentivize productivity during regular hours instead of overtime hours. Workers' wages increased significantly for regular working hours from applying higher base wages and improving productivity incentives while overtime hours decreased. Factory invest in new machinery uh, to simplify the production process. 
and improve uh, product quality and worker efficiency. We began to regularly share production and worker cap capacity information of the factory with our sourcing and production team and our clients, assign priorities based on clients' needs and production availability. In that way, we can have factory to reduce over time. We are identified the most prioritized orders that should be completed first. Then we met with uh, the worker representatives about the changes to the working schedule, compensation system, and machinery. Worker representatives provide feedback and vote to support the changes to the system for a secret wallet. So uh, factories com uh, combine staff trained workers uh, on a salary and benefits changes, as well as the new machinery. And it took about a month to provide this training to all workers. So as you may see, because of uh, the successful uh, result of the pilot one uh, uh, to our vendors uh, factory, we adopt the same way to this factory and we empower the vendor as a mentor to monitor the entire remediation process. Thanks, James. And, and thanks for highlighting the importance of, I think it was two things. One was on the machinery updates that the factory did that allowed for some efficiency improvements, but then also two, the importance of training the workers on that new machinery, but then also their new um, wage and benefit system. And so, yeah, we saw themes of training um, engagement of workers throughout these case study examples, and especially in the newer example, um, the importance of of understanding the new machinery was also critical in ensuring that workers' um, wages could increase um, without having to work significant overtime. Um, and so I want to get to Annie next. Um, could you talk a little bit more on um, the responsible purchasing practices aspect? And, and Puma has a very extensive responsible purchasing practices program. We evaluated that through the reaccreditation process. And could you just talk a little bit more on, on how um, uh, building that program, improving it over time, and, and really establishing the commitments to responsible purchasing practices helped impact the remediation of overtime violations in the factory. Yes, so uh, as you know, this factory is quite an average size factory with more than 5,000 workers. So the remediation plan is really a long journey. Um, so as a brand, we work together with the factory for the re remediation plan. So together, Puma and the factory set an important role to ensure that the workers, they work with the factory, they know how they will pay. And Puma Soxin's production team work together with the factory to ensure that the orders we give to them are appropriate, given the change that the factory was implementing. Uh, we especially consider whether this would be the change in efficiencies or productivity as the overtime will be decreased and the account for this change in setting orders timeline. So uh, the factory also integrated with Puma Lynch approach to make the production lines and as productivity and efficiency as possible. So this approach also diversify worker skill sets and allow the worker to more easily reach production targets as a team within their production line. And in addition, no, uh, the factory uh, also under Better Work Service. So, to, so the factory also work closely with the Better Work on the remediation plans in terms of changing from fixed rate to hourly rates. And they receive a lot of consultants and guidance from Better Work Vietnam team on legal requirements, improve industrial relations to support the change smoothly and ensure that the new um, hourly wage system will follow the legal requirements. So in three years from 2016 to 2019, um, the factory, its workers, Puma, Better Work Vietnam, they work together to close the living wage gap. And with the incentive base and leave base, so you can see right now the workers' uh, monthly net wage is above 26% of uh, 2019 GLWC living for rural areas of Vietnam. Thanks, Annie. And, you know, 
I think it's really important that you mentioned that um, Puma's sourcing team understood that the factory was going through changes, that they were shifting um, their production model, they were adopting Puma's lean model, and that this this just might be a complicated process. And so it's it's great to hear that the sourcing team really understood that, worked with the factories, committed to providing orders. So the factory felt comfortable in, in going through these changes because we have to understand that this is hard work from a management perspective and an HR perspective. So um, I think it was really helpful for you to, to highlight that. And then also highlight how it really was a collaborative effort with Puma, the factory, and, and Better Work Vietnam was also in that factory um, looking at remediation, providing guidance um, on you know how perhaps the uh, factory could improve the wage system for workers. So really just a collaborative effort um, to really get that remediation plan off the ground. So great work on that and really just want to commend Puma and all our companies uh, on this webinar for the progress that they've made. Okay, so then I want to get um, back to Maxport. And um, can we talk about here, you know, one of the critical pieces around improving wages is how uh, workers are engaged through that process. Could you talk about how Maxport's management team engaged with workers um, through the remediation planning and the execution of some of the changes that were made? Uh, yes, um, as mentioned earlier, when talking about the root cause, uh, we realize that worker awareness and knowledge play a very important position in our factory working, our management. So throughout the remedies and planning and execution process, worker engage in training and capacity building and uh, consultations activity to raise their awareness as well and in capab capability as well as the um, sharing their concerns. And uh, firstly, in terms of raising awareness, um, our worker, uh, they got training on bio code, workplace code of conduct, uh, benchmark, benchmark and standard, uh, as well as company policy, so that they can understand deeply the rights and their obligation to know about the impacts of excessive working schedule on their health and other aspects like work-life balance um, um, and their safety and uh, yeah, many relevant um, aspects. Uh, in addition, one of my spots in our research and development uh, that enable us to cooperate with buyer during innovation design state, resulting in the ability to handle a wide range number of style, different type of product. So it's as the 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 uh, the demand for our workers so need to to enhance and um, improve their um, skill and the capability to handle with um, the challenge in production uh, and to promote the efficiency. Uh, so worker keep being trained to handle different type of products, production processes, and uh, new machinery so that it could become multi-skilled worker and quickly adapt when we our situation and context uh, changes. And um, they also became more engaged in the sampling process. This means that when style were approved for bug production, there were a more efficient transition from sampling to production and um, our right, Worker are very like skillful to to be a uh, monthly start and and working at um variety of di different um like job uh positions so they can they can like uh promote themselves and 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 improve themselves um and this um engagement happened at own my sport or factory not just the assess one not just the five hundred worker like we mentioned in 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 the insights. And uh, we keep a uh, strong and even go for 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 my sport. And as uh, Ms. Fung had um, talked earlier, when we got um, the changes in in the incentive um, system, uh, we we got before the we apply the chain, uh, we got um, engaged with the trade union and factory representative to work with um, mm -hmm. worker. So the factory trade union talk with worker to understand re the reaction to the upcoming change. And when we apply chain, we will like got provide training and information so that employee and worker can deeply understand what they are, what, what did they have and what wins they have. So they can compare by themselves to realize the changes and the reason why we do that and the, the impact on their um, uh, wage and working hour and, and many things um, related so they can be uh, ready and uh, willing, willing to, to participate in, in the change of the company. And um, 
And I think that another key issue that workers become more and more aware of the work-life balance concepts because the development of um, like information of social media and, and yeah, and um, so they become more aware of the work-life balance concept resulting in the reduction of demand for working extra hours. They understand that they do not need to work more to, to earn more. So they just need to like to do their best within the regular working hour and 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 the um schedule um like overtime with the limit that um the allowed limit of working overtime so they can they can earn they can uh, get a good income but still um have time for family and for their for themselves and therefore we 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 learned that the capacity Capacity building program at Smithport will have it very helpful for workers to strengthen their skill and efficiency and awareness uh, so that they can devote during the allowed working schedule and help the company a lot to remediate the issue. Thanks, Hung. Okay, so we have three minutes left. I wanted to ask maybe everyone one more question. I'm not sure if we'll have time to do our final round, but um, there are a bunch of questions in the Q&A, a lot of them around just the leverage and the um, ownership around the factory. So I'm just going to just answer those questions broadly. So um, generally, if the um, buyers in the factory were a majority buyers and, and Maxport owns the facility that we studied for um, this case study. So that's just the general answer <laughs> for all three case studies. Um, okay, so we have maybe, I just wanted to talk a little bit more um, on uh, worker communication and engagement. So um, James, would you be able to speak to that in the New Era case? Yes, uh, yes. So uh, as I mentioned, we had a closely communication with the worker representatives about the change of the conversation and we let them to liaise with other workers about the change. We also request the factory's company staff to provide a very, very detailed training to workers on the salary and benefits changes to ensure that they understood their wages are actually increased, but not decreases. I want to pinpoint the importance of this secret bullet of worker representatives and allow workers to provide feedback because we need to have that consent instead of dictate them to change. And workers were able to provide feedback by freely liaising worker representatives or management if necessary. So that's it. Thanks, James. And Annie, I just want to quickly ask you, are there any um, maybe learnings from the case study that you just want to share um, as your final comments uh, from this webinar? Yes, of course. Yeah, we would like to share this successful case study to other suppliers. And it's important that uh, buyer and supplier understand the relationship between living bin waste, excessive overtime, worker communications, and engagements. So, um, so with this, uh, in 2019, Puma already uh, worked with FLA Fairway Network to conduct a fairway assessment in some country uh, in Bangladesh and in Cambodia. And this year we extended to Indonesia as well. So uh, in 2020, we also used uh, Puma, uh, sorry, FLA wage dashboard to address the wage data of 5% of our core factory. And this year we will extend up to 19 uh, factory and 19% of our core suppliers. And from the fairway assessment, so we will then set up a criteria of clear priorities together with our sourcing department to develop a blueprint on how to the, address the living wage challenge with our supplier. So this is what we will do uh, when we extend this assessment story to other suppliers. Thanks, Annie. And uh, Hung, any last comments on, on some of the learnings um, from your experience? Um, I think that uh, while we got some advantage um, when we um, in, when we approaching this um, topic of fair um, of fair compensation because we affiliated with Airways in two thousand and nine and we got uh, many years practice and uh, doing the worker wage uh, data collection. So we are like we understand we got understanding of how. Um, everybody expected and uh, what the international standard is, is, um, 
talking about the fair uh, compensation. So mm -hmm. we are still learning, uh, but we keep we keep learning and we keep practicing, and we we'll, we are working on our blueprints and got a lot um, very useful comment and advice from everywhere staff, and we will still look on it and and maybe yeah following the next step to public the commitment and um, cooperated with our way and other buyer who also said concern about fair compensation to promote the program. Thanks, Hung. Okay, so we're at time. Um, so we're going to wrap up this webinar. I want to just thank you again to all of our panelists, New Era, Maxport, and Puma for really sharing so many details um, around the living wage progress that was made. Uh, the report will be published in August, so please keep a lookout for that. And if you have any questions on anything that was covered today, whether it's the case study itself or some of the work that we're doing on living wages, please contact us at Fair comp at fairlabor.org so we can um, further the conversation and really drive industry progress towards living wages. So thanks everyone for joining. Have a great rest of your day or evening and uh, we hope we'll continue to work together on making living wage progress for workers. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you everyone.